Hallo, på vegne av Miljøpartiet De Grønne så vil jeg ønske velkommen. Hyggelig å se at så mange har tatt turen hit. Full sal. Jeg er da Øyden Solum og er kommunestyrerepresentant på Nesodden og også førstekandidat til stortingsvalget for Akershus. Og det som Olli er her og skal presentere er en sak som går rett inn i mye av det vi synes er sentralt også i De Grønne. Og særlig for så vidt de som er arrangementskomiteen, som er Mikkel Storm Kropstein fra Skosa partisekretær i De Grønne, og Nicole Charlin fra også mitt lag på Nesodden, som da har stått akkurat for dette arrangementet, selv om også andre har jobbet med dette andre steder tidligere også. I hvert fall, altså mens de fleste land har nasjonale lover mot drap av enkeltpersoner, så har vi også da dette med at hvis det skjer folkemord, massedrap, krigsforbrytelser og andre ting, så ser vi det som en internasjonal forpliktelse å gripe inn hvis det altså da ikke skjer nasjonalt. Poenget her er at det også burde gjelde massedrap, massemord på økosystemer, arter og så videre. Forløpig så har ikke da det internasjonale samfunnet juridiske midler til å kunne gripe inn, selv om man kan ha FN-konvensjoner som da sier at man bør gjøre det ene eller andre, så er det få maktmidler. Riktig nok så må jeg vel si at selv om da dette her handler om å få inn juridiske rammer for å kunne gripe inn hardere for de som svikter miljøet, svikter klima, så er jo like den største endringen som er nødvendig, en politisk endring, egentlig en verdimessig endring. For det er klart at det blir vanskelig for politikerne, det ser vi jo, å gjøre noe med det, hvis de ikke har den backingen fra folk som da sier at dette her er vår tids mest sentrale sak, altså i varetagelse av jorden, når vi er ferd med å undergrave rett og slett det livsgrunnlaget hele vår civilisasjon er bygget på, på grunn av da bare mer kortsiktig økonomisk gevinst, dels for noen, og kanskje dels også for de som tenker at det å få noen få tusenlapper ekstra i lønningen for da neste år er viktigere enn egentlig å sikre fremtiden for neste generasjon, eller for den saken skyr også en selv litt lenger frem. Så selv da, sånn som vi vil se det, så er det ikke engang en realistisk eller fornuftig egoisme. Hadde det vært en egoisme som hadde tatt inn over seg den virkeligheten vi lever i, så er en omlegging nødvendig. Økosid, som er da den begrepet som Polly trekker inn her, er nettopp da å peke på at her foregår det en utrivelse av arter, av planter, dyr, men også av hele økosystemet i et omfang som verden ikke har sett før, og som da er truer stivilisasjonen som sådan. Og så det vil si at hvis vi ønsker å ha et samfunn hvor vi fortsatt skal kunne krangle om hva vi er enige om eller ikke enige om, hva vi liker og ikke liker, hva vi har lyst til og ikke lyst til, så må vi faktisk sørge for at det grunnlaget er der. Og det handler da om naturen vi er, og det lever i og er en del av. Vi er ikke ute for det å bare se inn på det, men det er vi som nå også på en måte sitter med en del, i hvert fall av de avgjørende nøklene i forhold til også andre arter og vår egen arts fremtid. Folk har nok ikke vært så mye hverken bedre eller verre før i tiden, eller det kan man godt mene det ene eller andre om, men likevel så er vår tid annerledes i den forstand at det vi gjør nå, hvor det var nytt til mye større konsekvenser enn det har fått tidligere. Før har nok også folk tatt og utrydet både det ene og det andre rundt der de har bodd i sitt område, men vanligvis i hvert fall har de ikke fått de samme globale konsekvensene som vi ser nå. Så nå, dels på grunn av befolkningsøkning, dels på grunn av teknologisk utvikling og energiforbruk og alt som følger med det, så er vi i en helt ny situasjon som det ikke ser ut som hverken politikere eller folk flest fullt ut har tatt inn over seg. Man tenker fortsatt, i hvert fall oppfører man seg fortsatt, som om ting er ubegrenset, at det bare er å fortsette å forsyne seg av det hele, at havene kan ta imot hva det skal være. Og det kan de ikke, selv om jorden er stor, og kan av naturen se ut til å være mer fleksibel enn mange, for så vidt også kan ha fryktet før, så er det visse grenser. Det er jo blitt beregnet også at 
at vi i Vest, hvis alle skulle hatt det forbruket som vi har nå, man kan diskutere litt helt nøyaktig, så kunne det grovt sett være noe for mellom tre og fem jordkloder totalt sett, og ikke da den ene vi har i dag. Så en omlegging er nødvendig. Så er også spørsmålet da, ok, hvem er det da som på en måte står for illusjonsmakeri? Er det da de grønne som er et lite parti, og de som sier at dette skal rett og slett ikke være lov å drive og ødelegge livsgrunnlaget? Er det det som er drømmeri, eller er det sånne som Borten Mo, som først sier at de skal borre helt opp til Nordpolen, og som senest også i dag nå kjemper for borring av olje utenfor Lofoten? Hvem er det som lurer folk? Etter min, og også mange i de grønnes mening, og stadig flere også utenfor det, så er det de som lurer folk, for det er faktisk ikke mulig. Ifølge beregninger så er det også slik at kanskje i beste fall 20 prosent, eller en tredjedel av den oljen som er funnet, kan tas opp uten at da klimamålene blir sprengt. Så det vil si at hvis man da, når man da fortsatt leter etter oljereserver, og hvis man også tror at man skal kunne ta opp det fra Nordsjøen, så enten lurer man folk, de pengene kan man rett og slett ikke tjene, eller så gir man blaffen mot bedre vitene om at jo da, man kan tjene dem, men da vil det ha det stike, da vil det bli klimaendringer, da vil det bli ødeleggelser som man da eventuelt ikke bryr seg om. Det bryr vi oss om. Vi mener at det ikke bør være greit. Vi mener at den type politikere som fremmer en sånn politikk, bør stoppes. Og for så vidt derfor både håper og tror vi at det vil skje en endring, at de grønne vil komme inn på tinget. Og vi tror også da at den type initiativ som Pauli Higgins nå driver og fremmer internasjonalt, som også har blitt støttet av grønne partier rundt i hele Europa, er blant de virkemidlene vi kan bruke hvis og når vi kommer i posisjon nettopp til å peke på dette. Det skal ikke være greit å ødelegge vår felles fremtid. Det skal ikke være slik at noen få mektige personer, enten på grunn av egne næringsinteresser, eller på grunn av personlige politiske ambisjoner om å da appellere til velgegrupper, skal kunne ødelegge fremtiden, ikke bare for folk i dag, men også da for fremtiden. Så det er det som er illusjoner. Men hvis man snakker om de grønne som er drøm, så vil jeg si at den drømmen blir mer som Martin Luther Kings drøm, som da var drømmen om opphevelse av slaveri. Man kan også si at det er det samme som skjer i dag i forhold til menneskets forhold til naturen. Vi mener at naturen må få en stemme, dels gjennom juridiske midler, dels gjennom politiske veier. Og det er den drømmen som vi vil kjempe for, og som også er den eneste realistiske og mulige drømmen. For hvis det ikke skjer, så vil også da det de andre såkalte realpolitikerne kjemper for, det er det som da vil blåse vekk. Men det er klart, i det, i dette, så er jo også De Grønne et parti som ser at jo da, vi har jo ikke akkurat regjeringen alene, og vi er også veldig glad av denne for at blant annet Nikolai Astrup, som kanskje da vil, veldig sannsynlig, vil sitte i et regjeringsparti til høsten, for alt jeg vet også med hånden på rett i Miljøverdepartementet, er her nå og skal være med å diskutere og komme med innspill etter Polly Higgins sitt innledning etterpå. For det er klart at den type løsninger som vi ønsker oss, krever et samarbeid på tvers av partigrenser. Det krever at man går sammen og lager løsninger som favner mer enn bare en liten gruppe, og for oppsett en voksen gruppe tenker seg. Det blir jo litt sånn som også før andre verdenskrig, eller under andre verdenskrig, hvor man på en måte er villig til å sette veldig mange andre ting til side, og si at nå er det en sak som på en måte må stå i sentrum for prioriteringene, og da må man gå i sammen, også på tvers av tradisjonelle skillegrenser, både politisk og ideologisk på andre måter. Og sånn sett så passer det også det helt i tråd med De Grønnes parti, som altså da ikke bare er for biologisk mangfold, men også for så vidt for det kulturelle biomangfold, altså at vi nettopp mener at et mangfoldig samfunn med ulike synspunkter, hvor det er lov å være forskjellig og tenke forskjellig, ikke bare er greit, men at det er et gode. Det er en del også av den tanken mot monokulturer, altså som også er en del av de utfordringene mot økosid, mot ødeleggelse av økosystemer, altså hvor da også storindustrien utsletter store områder, kanskje av Amazonas, for å dyrke soya eller enkelte varer som man så mater inn i en matindustri, som så visker ut mer og mer. Så den type monokulturtenkning, 
monopoltenkning står også i strid både med hva det vi ønsker å fremme, og også blir det samme at det Polly Higgins peker på som da trussel mot, eh, mot alle økosystemene, eh, er nettopp å se på, på disse, den type sammenhenger. Så derfor sier jeg i hvert fall velkommen til deg. Jeg vil spikke inn i Norwegian, for jeg vil understand at least uh, that it is uh, support of using so please <laughs> now you come with the presentation and then after that uh, uh, Mikkel which is uh, um, uh, secretary in the, in the Green Party will take over and lead the panel with Nikola Astrup and Andrew Kroglund uh, after that and then in then also question answers from uh, from the <coughs> audience uh, to you and to the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's an absolute delight to be here. I, I, I really feel honoured to have this opportunity to bring to you I, the work that I'm, I'm taking forward here. And I was asked, actually, before I, I started speaking about my work, to say a little bit about me and how I've ended up on this truly remarkable journey. I, as you know, I am a lawyer, but I, this is a journey. You need me closer. Is that better? Oh, yes, I can hear that. It is. My journey really started seven years ago I, as a lawyer in court when, when I discovered myself. I looking out of the window, as you do. <laughs> and I had a moment to really kind of contemplate the work that I was doing. My background is as a corporate lawyer, not an environmental lawyer. And I had spent years representing corporations, individuals, employees in corporations. And this was the culmination of a three year long case where I had been representing an individual who had been very badly harmed and injured in the workplace. We were in the Royal Courts of Justice in the Court of Appeal and it was judgment day. We were waiting for the judges to come in and there was a delay. So this is where I found myself staring out the window and the courtroom was very high up in the building. So I could see right across London, right across trees and parks, right across, it, it kind of like being on top of the world for a moment. And I find myself thinking that there's something out there, something else out there that's been very badly harmed and injured, and that's the earth. And my next thought really changed my life. I find myself thinking the earth is in need of a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> happening there was that I, I was being given an opportunity, a choice. I, I had reached a, a moment in time where the road was opening up for me, either to continue down the road well travelled that I was on and continue making an awful lot of money as a lawyer, <laughs> or, or to step off and step into the unknown. I step into that space where we really challenge ourselves, where we get outside our comfort zone uh, and really I step into the unknown, but with a commitment of some, something, something to be in service to something greater than self. And I, I asked myself a question, how do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? Uh, and I looked around me to see what laws out there, I, 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 and I understood environmental law is not working, it's clearly not working, you just have to look at the Amazon to see it's not working. Uh, and I could see that environmental law itself was inherently flawed because it's, it's not representing the interests of the earth, of nature, or, or the beings on this, on this earth. It was largely protecting the interests of the polluter. We have permits to pollute. That protects the polluter. It may limit the amount of pollution, but you can ultimately end up selling more and more permits, which escalates the problem. Or, you know, the other side of it is a lot of environmental laws premised on fines, catch me if you can laws. Very often those who are adversely impacted by huge environmental damage and destruction 
are communities that have neither the financial wherewithal or the legal understanding as to how, how to actually bring civil litigation into the courts. And even if that does happen, it can take many years, and any payout when it comes is often too little too late. So it seemed to me that we have a system that is not fit for purpose, and that there's space here for a new law to be created, a new law that comes from a very different place, very different value basis. Uh, and ecocide is a very important driver within this. This is in effect about birthing a whole new body of law, earth law. And the beauty is, is that it's, it's needed. <laughs> and the world is responding to this very favorably, and very fast, very quickly. So I'd like to take you a little bit on that journey. Uh, I'd like to explain a little bit about the law. And I'd like to tell you about where we are in, in this journey. And also why I think Norway is important in this new story of evolution. Because really this is about us giving birth to a new world. And when we do that, that's about creating new terms of engagement, if you like. And we need bridges to take us there as well. And law has caused a lot of problems here, but law can also create some of the solutions. Not all, but they can certainly create some of the important bridges to get there. And the law of ecocide is a very big bridge in this new world. So I'd like to take you back in time a little bit. I, in fact, the Copenhagen negotiations, I, one of the people I met there is here today, Torment, sitting in this audience, and he first brought me to Norway a few years ago. When, it, when I was in Copenhagen, I, I was on a platform with one of our British journalists, I, called George Monbiot, and someone in the audience said, we need a new language to deal with this mass damage and destruction. And I found myself thinking, that is absolutely right. We really do. It's like genocide, only it's eco-side. <gasps> that should be a crime. And it was really a big idea there. I, that really answered my question of how do we create a legal duty of care for the earth. And I found myself literally running back to London after the negotiations with this very big idea. How could we create, is it possible, would it work to actually put in place an international crime, an international law of ecocide? So what I did, like any good lawyer, was I went back to first principles to see what was in place there already uh, and whether or not this was workable. And this is really where our starting point is. We already have what's known collectively as crimes against peace. These are the most uh, serious crimes of concern to humanity at large, and they are crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, and crimes of aggression is, is the most recent one that's been brought into being just two years ago in 2010. Now, these are international crimes that largely govern the well-being of life itself. In fact, the starting point is the sacredness of life that fundamental understanding, that intrinsic value, that life itself is sacred. Now, the interesting thing is with these four international crimes that we have, they are largely governing human-to-human -human engagement. And what I'm looking at is how we expand our vision of concern. It's not just human-to-human -human engagement, but it's human-to-non-human -human engagement. And that's about the interconnectedness of life itself. Destroy the very earth that we walk on, and we destroy our ability to live in peaceful enjoyment. So it seemed to me that what we needed to do was to expand this remit of understanding of international crimes, where we really take a stance and we say, no more are we going to cause destruction at such an extensive level at the very top end and expand that from well-being of largely human life to well-being of all life. And that there's a missing fifth crime against peace, uh, and that is ecocide. What I did was I proposed into the international, uh, into the UN Law Commission, uh, a fully worked proposal. 
But what I also realized was that there was very good reason for doing this. And here are some statistics that we have as to why we need to actually come to a point within civilization and say no more do we cause this mass damage and destruction. Here, here are some very simple facts on that. Every single day, and we're talking about during peacetime here, not wartime. You know, this is peacetime destruction that's happening here, where it's now recorded, the IUCN say that 100 living species become extinct every day. A thousand acres of peat bogs are excavated every day. 150,000 acres of tropical rainforests are destroyed every day. Two million tons of toxic waste are dumped every day. 22 million tons of oil are extracted every day. 100 million tons of greenhouse gases are released every day. This is enormous. You get that sense of the enormity of the destruction that's at play here. And most of the time, it's not deliberate. It's not wanton. It's, it's a consequence often as a result of industrial activity. Now, a very good report was brought out in 2010, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Report, which was commissioned by many countries across the world, including Norway <coughs> and, and Europe. And there was a very instructive number crunching exercise where I, the top companies in the world were examined to look at the mass damage and destruction that was being caused for the year 2008 just by corporate activity. And what was discovered was that it was $2.2 trillion of damage and destruction for just one year. Now that's larger than most GDPs or countries. Uh, so this is a huge number. But what was most alarming about this little bit of research was the discovery that 2010 was expected to be, 2009 was expected to be four trillion, and 2010 double again. So it, it's rather like one of those hockey stick graphs <coughs> that we see. It just gets steeper, faster, and higher the quicker we go through. So somewhere along the line, we're exponentially, it's like a, a snowball. It's getting worse and worse and faster and faster and quicker and quicker. So this, this gives very good reason as to why we really need legislation to call a halt to this. It's not, voluntary measures are not enough now. We need mandatory measures put in place. And that really requires it at an international level, not simply a national level. Now, this is, this is actually the workings of a drawing that was really the back of an envelope uh, for me to try and understand what it was I was, I was bringing into being here. Because I was understanding that where we cause damage and destruction, which I call ecocide, and, and I'll explain that, what that term really means in a moment, it leads to, amongst other things, resource depletion, which leads to conflict, which of course can lead to war. And what we're seeing is a hermetically sealed cycle of damage and destruction that's spiraling onwards and upwards faster and faster and faster. It's not about slowing that down, it's actually about stopping it in its tracks. And this is where a law of ecocide really comes into its own as a disruptor. We want to disrupt this cycle that's spiraling out of control, actually halt it, and change the direction in a completely different direction altogether. We literally come in and stop that never-ending cycle that's spiraling out of control now. Now this is the beginnings of the proposed definition that I was submitted into the UN Law Commission I, back in March 2010. Uh, ecocide is the extensive destruction, damage to or loss of ecosystems of a given territory. And this can be caused in two different ways. But possibly the most important word here within this definition, and each word, each term is legally weighted and has been subjected to intense legal scrutiny. The most important word here is inhabitants. <coughs> it doesn't say to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by humans has been severely diminished. It's by inhabitants. Because if you look at any given territory, so much more lives there than just humans. 
And this is really about understanding our interconnectedness with life. Now, when I was a child, I used to fear bees. I used to run away when they come and try and sting us. Actually, I didn't really fear them um, because we had, we had a bee's nest under the eaves of the house and we used to get sticks <laughs> to really aggravate them so that they would all come out very angry and then we'd run away very fast. <laughs> but I was brought up to believe that bees were to be feared because they stung you. But my relationship with bees has changed dramatically in the last few years. And I understand that bees are sacred. They are our great pollinators. Or they're one of our great pollinators. And now we're looking at colony collapse disorder throughout the world. And that lose our bees, we lose 70% of our foodstuffs overnight. Now, I know no head of state that knows how to pollinate like a bee can. <laughs> but it gives us an example of how important our interdependency and interconnectedness is with life itself. And that one species alone can really have an adverse impact on how we live in peaceful enjoyment if we are to lose our pollinators altogether. Two different types of ecocide through human agency, which is largely but not entirely corporate ecocide, and other causes naturally occurring ecocide. So human, human caused ecocide. Examples are mining, fossil fuel extraction, toxic waste dumping, deforestation. One that played out literally three weeks after I submitted the proposal into the UN Law Commission was the BP Gulf oil spill. And that really accelerated what was happening here because suddenly I had journalists I, and uh, lawyers right across the world engaging in the proposal that I had submitted into the UN Law Commission because we made it public. We, we put it out on the internet, we got a, a website up very quickly. And that really drove international engagement in a very big way. The word ecocide itself has been around since the 1970s. All I'm doing is I'm giving it legal definition. I didn't know that then when I first thought of it, but it does have its own history. It's just not very well known or understood here in the Western world, but I, South America's Spanish-speaking nations understand ecocidio very well and are at the receiving end of ecocidio on a daily basis. So it's a word that really is not so prevalent in our culture, but it has huge legacy and understanding and resonance elsewhere. If anything, we've almost shied away from the word. We see it as a very emotive word. And yet, look how we have normalized the word pesticide. Because that's lawful, we don't see it as a problem. And yet, ecocide, somehow resonates very deeply within us. We understand the enormity of, of what's playing out here. Other causes, naturally occurring ecocides, tsunamis, rising sea levels, floods, earthquakes, anything that causes ecosystem collapse, that is a naturally occurring ecocide. Now, how can we play this into law? Because of course, yes, you could take a prosecution for a company that's causing deforestation, uh, of course. But could you take a company to court for causing an earthquake? So that's an interesting question. And it depends. It depends on a number of factors. But what's so important here is that there can be a causal nexus between human-caused ecocide and naturally occurring ecocide. I'll give you an example. The Athabasca tar sands in Canada, a vast tract of land, which is, if expansion proceeds as is proposed, will be the size of England and Wales combined, which I think is 45,000 square kilometers of land over the next eight to 12 years will be destroyed. And that's about ripping up vast tracts of arboreal wetlands, <coughs> ancient wetlands uh, and arboreal forests for unconventional tar extraction. Now we call it unconventional tar extraction because we can no longer conventionally extract oil. We can no longer go, in it, go into the land and just drill down and it spouts up. I'm very interested in the oil industry 
uh, my great 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 grandfather I discovered when I started researching the oil industry was in fact the man who discovered the world's largest ever oil field. <laughs> Imagine my amazement to discover that Pat Higgins was my direct descendant. <laughs> so I come from a legacy uh, of um, someone who gave birth to the oil industry and I carry that karma. <laughs> but it's very interesting to me because of course here my my ancestor, he did not look to the consequences. He didn't understand. How could he possibly understand what we, this would be rise to? And certainly how it would evolve into what we have now with unconventional tire extraction in the Athabasca tar sands, which is causing enormous damage and destruction on an enormous scale. And that, that has huge consequences, not just for humanity but for the earth itself and for future generations. So for instance, to give an example, one way of measuring damage and destruction is uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's just one measurement. There are many ways of measuring damage and destruction, but if we look at that in terms of the un of unconventional tire extraction, that is, that is triggering uh, and contributing to instability in the atmosphere by warming it which of course means that we have melting ice in the Arctic, which then puts at risk 54 small island states that are looking at rising sea levels, such as the Maldives. Now, we couldn't hold an oil company to account for rising sea levels in the Maldives for something that's playing out in Alberta. But what we can do is hold that company to account for the damage and destruction that's playing out there and also look to the longer term consequences as being contributory. What is also very important here is that it's about imposing a legal duty of care, not just at a corporate level, but also at a political, at the very top end of the political world as well. So this is about governments, this is about heads of states, about ministers, and also the world of finance, because of course this is ultimately about the flow of money. So this is about imputing a legal duty of care on governments to give assistance for those who are, are at risk of naturally occurring ecocide. That whole dialogue around what do we do with 54 small island states that are looking at going underwater within the next decade is just not happening in climate negotiation terms. And in fact, climate negotiations themselves have failed. We saw that playing out in Copenhagen and they are stumbling on. 17 years of subjecting the process to some form of negotiation when ultimately the earth is not up for negotiation. We destroy this earth and, and it's game over. But this is the interesting thing, it's not game over. It's very much game on. This is about changing the rules of the game and the law are the rules of the game of life. And that's what's very important here about actually bringing into place something that can fundamentally shift the norms of society and how we engage with what we deem to be destructive activity and therefore we no longer want to do and moving on to something else that's life affirming rather than life destroying. So what I would like to do is actually take you back in time in history, 200 years, to a time when civilization actually took a huge step and actually shifted its consciousness and engaged with law as a lever, as a catalyst for fundamental change at a very deep level. Now, 200 years ago in Britain, it was William Wilberforce, the parliamentarian, who took up the mantle for the abolition of slavery. And he recognised that holding a man or a woman in chains just by dint of their colour and treating them as a commodity was in and of itself wrong. And he understood that this wasn't about doing it a little less. He understood that this must stop altogether. Now, of course, when William Wilberforce came along, and he, he said three very interesting things, actually. He said that, first of all, we have to put in place the laws that can actually act as the lever to change this, to outlaw that which is wrong. Secondly, we have to pull the subsidies that are propping it up. 
Slavery was very heavily subsidized, not just by the British taxpayer, the Dutch, and many, many countries right across the world. And in fact, not just slavery directly, but also the secondary industries that arose out of it. The first ever monocot plantations, sugar, were heavily dependent on the slave trade. But of course, when, when William Wilberforce came along, he spoke out. He met with a wall of objection from industry. And at that time, there were 300 companies that were either directly or indirectly involved in slavery, whether or not it was the facilitation of the shipping of, of slaves or the making of boats to take them there. And industry said, you can't stop slavery. That's impossible. It's a necessity. The public demands that slavery remain. And if you get rid of slavery, it will lead to economic collapse. And instead, what industry did was they, they, they proposed different solutions. They said, look, we will put in place self-regulation, voluntary measures. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll limit the numbers, we'll create a cap, and we will undertake an internal trading. You know, if we're about to go over our limits or less limits, we can trade within each other on this. So leave it to market forces to resolve the problem. We'll create tradable permits, in effect. In fact, one uh, businessman proposed into government uh, improvement of conditions. We'll give more hay for bedding on the boats. Given that two-thirds of slaves were dying in transit over to Britain, it wasn't hay that was going to make the difference here. But what was very interesting was that when Push came to the shop, it said, OK, if you have to put in laws, then make it a fine. You know, if we go over our numbers, fine us. Catch me if you can, laws. And Mulder said, no, that's not enough. This is about criminalizing it. This is about closing the door to this altogether. It's not about doing it a little less. Now, what's so interesting is if we compare then to now, what's changed? Well, what's very interesting here, and this is a picture of the Athabasca tar sands, that's a toxic tailing pond there. In fact, some of those toxic tailing ponds can be over 200 kilometers in length. So it's not really a pond, this is huge lakes. And of course, migrating birds, the Athabasca Peace Delta, uh, the four main North American migratory routes stop off in the Athabasca Peace Delta. And birds don't know the difference between a toxic tailing pond and a wetland. Between 22 and 26 million birds fly over and land there every year. Now, we don't even have the data of how much is being lost here. What ecosystems are really being destroyed, but it's happening at an enormous rate. But what we are seeing here are direct parallels between then and now. Because, of course, industry is saying the same thing. We don't want laws in place you know, to actually close the door to unconventional tar extraction, for instance, would lead to economic collapse. Public demand, energy, um, it's a necessity. So the same arguments are being put forward. The only difference between William Wilberforce's time and now, and the abolition of slavery, is that the British government ultimately refused to accept the proposals that were on the table. And today what we have done is we have explored those proposals largely through climate negotiations, a cap and trade system under the Kyoto Protocol. And what we see is that it doesn't work. It's not fit for purpose. It's an inherently flawed process. And it is for a number of reasons. One of them being that I bringing uh, negotiators to the table when you can bring as many negotiators as you like to the table means that there is a huge imbalance of power where somewhere like the Maldives can only afford to bring five negotiators to the table but America can afford to bring 500 to the table. And you can see how imbalance plays out. In fact, it is a most unusual process that we use with climate negotiations. That is not a normal process that is applied through the United Nations system. Usually it's a two-third majority vote, voting system that's applied. But we have taken it as a norm. Uh, and really this is about challenging norms. Just because it's a norm doesn't mean that it's necessarily right. And what we're seeing is it's playing out 17 years on. It's not working. 
So this is really about actually recognizing that, well, back in William Wilberforce's time, these were hurdles that were overcome. And literally, within a very short time span, once laws were put in place, and William Wilberforce was a man who was told when he first stood up and called for the abolition of slavery, you're mad, you can never get rid of slavery. He died a happy man. The final laws were put in place two days before he died. So he did die with a smile on his face. <laughs> but what is so interesting here is that what we saw playing out in the history of civilization was when civilization actually took a quantum leap in consciousness. It was recognized that no longer was it acceptable to treat humanity as a commodity, to buy and sell, to use and abuse without consequence. We started to take responsibility. And this had very long-term implications right across the board. In fact, it meant that when we did put in place a universal declaration of human rights, it wasn't just a universal declaration of white man's rights. And out of that, then we have discrimination legislation as well. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have slavery in hidden forms. We do. And that doesn't mean that Amnesty International aren't going to be out of a job tomorrow. They're not. But at least they have the tools legislatively to deal with this. But for me, as a barrister, as a lawyer, I do not have the tools in place, the laws in place, so that I can represent the earth in court. And that's what's so very important here. It's about closing that door. And I believe we can do it just as we did with the abolition of slavery. And we did it again when we ended genocide. Believe it or not, some countries had laws in place which made it lawful to commit genocide, of course. And we got to a point where we said, no, enough. We draw a line in the sand, we close the door to that. And we create an international crime of genocide. And we did it again with apartheid as well. And this is very important because this is now us doing it again, once more, with the crime of ecocide. So this is really about taking a moral wrong and recognizing that it can be uh, transposed into a criminal wrong. In fact, we have a term in law that we use when malum in se becomes malum prohibita. When something is wrong in and of itself, we prohibit it. And that really is about fundamentally shifting norms and taking responsibility for our actions at the very top end. What happens when we do that is that we begin to recognize that we have fundamental rights, not just as humans, but actually it takes it further. It's a fundamental right of life that applies to humans and non-humans. The right to life applies to the earth as well. And various countries already recognize this, and Norway has this in its constitution. Everyone has a right to an environment that ensures health and a natural world or nature, natural environment whose production capacity and diversity is maintained. So really what this is saying here is that actually it's a human right to biodiversity, to the flourishing and the well-being of nature, of earth itself. You have that in your constitution. And that's quite remarkable piece of legislation that you have here. Now, this is something that really calls our governments to account, because actually we elect our ministers, we elect our, our parliamentarians on the, on the basis that they represent our best interests, our well-being. But it's also it's a recognition that it's a well-being provision that extends itself. It's not just human well-being, it's the well-being of nature as well. Because our well-being is dependent on the, the nature of the, the, the well-being of nature. And here's the thing. We've now become such a globalized society that what plays out in our decision making here in one country can have adverse consequences in another country. Decision making that's made in offices here can have adverse impact over there which could contribute globally to adverse impact everywhere in the long term. And especially when we're looking at escalation of climate change here. So looking at companies like Statoil, there's a company whose primary remit 
is the well-being of the people of this country. So how does this play in with this provision that's here? Well, I think this is very interesting because law has caused a lot of the problems. Here you have a company that's part state-owned, that is there in service to its people. But at the moment, the only way that that company can move forward and ensure that it profits from what it's doing is to engage in dangerous industrial activity, like unconventional tar extraction out in Canada. And that is because, not just Statoil, but every company in the world, its number one legal duty is to put the interest of its shareholders first. And that means putting profit first. So it's very difficult for a company like Statoil to move forward and just turn around and get into renewables. In fact, that would damage their bottom line hugely, which would mean that shareholders would lose faith, which would mean that shareholder value would drop, which would mean um, adverse impact on the national economy. Can't, can't do it just now, literally cannot do it. And this is very interesting for me. In fact, we had one business leader in Austria speaking out from an energy company uh, just a couple of months ago saying that, and this is a company that's moving into fracking, I'm forced to do what I'm doing even though I do not want to do it. So we have good people working within these companies that are hidebound by laws that have caused the problem because the laws do not look to the consequences. They don't, do not take it into account. But taking it into account is not enough actually. This is about prioritizing a very simple premise from the very outset, at the very top end. And that premise is, first, do no harm. And when we put that in place as an international law, with the law of ecocide, that's really what you're doing. You say, first, do no harm. Then it drives a very different decision-making process. And I'd like to take you through that to, to explain how that would work. So the law of ecocide is about to be, or has been put in place. And you are my directors of Statoil. <laughs> and we have a decision to make here. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue with unconventional tar extraction in the Athabasca tar sands, which under this legislation will cause, and is causing, and has already caused mass damage, destruction to or loss of ecosystems? Our problem with the horizon very fast then that means that governments like Canada will no longer in law be able to support our activities there unless we do one of two things. Either we develop processes that allow us to go in and instead of causing the mass butchery, so to say, we develop the keyhole surgery that does not cause mass damage destruction to our speaker system. That could be very expensive could take a lot of time. Or, what is being prioritised now in law, because it is international law, and therefore governments have to adhere to this, is that it's the innovation in the other direction, renewables. That's not contrary to Statoil's interest, because actually it's the security of the nation's citizens that's at stake here. And if they're to ensure energy security, then actually moving into renewables could be a far more economically viable route to take. But what's more, governments by law now have to withdraw subsidies into uh, fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is subsidised to enormous sums every year. Those subsidies will be withdrawn over, and I have proposed a five-year transition period, and those subsidies will then be freed up, because this is all about the flow of money, into the innovation in the other direction, suddenly renewable energy becomes very low risk and fossil fuel extraction becomes very high consequence. And this is why I call it a crime of consequence because you have to actually examine are our, are our activities going to cause mass damage destruction to a lot of ecosystems. And the individual that comes in and writes the environmental impact assessment will by, by law have to answer that question and will be held accountable in the court of law if it's sidestepped. And that's very important here because also this is about the flow of money. What we'll find is that investment will no longer flow into dangerous industrial activity because investors will have very long-term signals indicating 
that a far safer bet is investment in the innovation, the technology in the other direction, the renewables, the new solutions that are coming forward that are not life destroying, but in fact are life affirming. And that's what's so crucial here. So this is a slide to really um, explain where we are at the moment and where we can go and where we can go very fast. I, the predominant paradigm that we're living in is this paradigm of looking at the earth as a thing. And when we do that, we see the earth as a piece of property which we can buy, we can sell, we can use, we can abuse. I own, it's mine, I own it. Ownership, it's the law of contract. Who has a contract between what company and what country? And what we do is when we commoditize it, of course, we impose a value on it, we put a price tag on it, and that's why we can buy it and sell it without looking to the consequences. It's, it's a commodity. But there is another way of looking at this, and that's about viewing the earth as a living being. And when we do that, that's a different set of governance altogether. It's about what's known as trusteeship law. And trusteeship law is when we look long term for the benefit of future generations. It's no longer about profit margins playing out and quarterly returns, annual returns. In fact, we now have day traders whose sole job is to maximize returns in any given 24 hour period. And we fundamentally shift our perception to where do we want to be in 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years time? What is it that we need to put in play now that will benefit all later, far later down the road. And this is about our fundamental shift in our values, away from imposed values driving our decision making to intrinsic <coughs> values, the recognition that life itself is sacred. It doesn't come as a price. It's not about ecosystem services, putting a price on it. And if you destroy it, you just pay up. That is catch me if you can fines at the end of the day. It's about saying no, no longer do we cause the mass damage and destruction. And it comes from a very different place. Because of course, when we're looking at the earth as a commodity, just as we did with slaves, they were just a commodity, another form of energy, actually. Then there is a disconnect that happens. Because really it's coming from here. It's not coming from here. And this is the difference between I own and I owe a legal duty of care. It's about taking responsibility and care comes from the heart. It's about caring. And we use that as a legal term, a legal duty of care. It comes from a very different place. This is about us all becoming trustees of the earth, in effect, and taking responsibility individually and collectively as to what plays out next. So ecocide is a crime against humanity. Uh, destroy the earth, we destroy our ability to live in peace, peaceful enjoyment. It's of course a crime against nature. It, it's a crime against future generations, but most importantly, it is a crime against peace. And again, this is where Norway comes into play here. This is a country that has advocated peace on the global arena in a very big way. And every year you celebrate by giving peace prizes. This is a country that asks a very fundamental question about individuals out there who are aspiring to do the best in service to something bigger than themselves, to become peacemakers, to really help advance civilization to the next stage. This is about daring to be great. And that's what I'm doing. I, I'm daring to be great in, in all that I do in life. Um, and that's quite a challenge, especially when you out yourself <laughs> and let people know that that's what you do. But I think that's about each and every single one of us daring to be great, bringing our own skills to bear to create the beautiful world that we all want. It's absolutely up to us where we go with this. And this is a country that does understand that and celebrates that. And I am asking each of you here today to dare to be great in whatever capacity, whatever your skills are, to advance a world of peace. 
Just think what can happen when more and more of us step up. Because this is the thing, we have a choice in life. We can sit back and be observers of a world that is causing mass damage and destruction. And when we do that, we become complicit in a system that does not work. Or we can stand up and become participants in co-creating that new world. Now, this may sound like woolly words, but it's not, actually. And you have a museum down there that celebrates those who have taken that first step in that direction and look what they manifest in their lives and make happen. And that is truly remarkable. And this is what's so very important here, and it's not about getting peace prizes, not at all, but it's about the intent of where we go in our lives and what we can achieve in our lives. And this is a law that can be put in place in our lives. I truly believe that. This is my wish, is to end ecocide by 2020. And I believe we can do this. And in fact, I had 26 governments asking for a timeline for implementation of law of ecocide. And book number one, um, Eradicating Ecocide, sets out uh, the initial steps on this, this journey that's, that's unfolding. What is so interesting here is that this is an idea whose time has come. And nobody has ownership over a good idea. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, this is really about us all being trustees in this whole process as we move this along. But the beauty is, is that there is the possibility, there is a window of opportunity opening up here where this can be tabled for a decision at an international level at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. The Rome Statute is the governing document that sets out the existing international crimes against peace and it codifies the existing crimes against peace. That was put in place in 2002 and it also put in place the International Criminal Court. Now, what was very interesting about the Rome Statute was when it was being drafted up, was that over an 11 year period from 1985 to 1996, there were, in fact, five crimes against peace, and the ecocide was one of them. It had been drafted into the original document. And for 11 years, there were lawyers and special rapporteurs, hundreds of them, uh, and representatives from every single country who were actively engaged in drafting in ecocide as an international crime against peace. At pretty much the 11th hour, that was withdrawn despite the fact that many countries had gone publicly on record in support of this international law. And Norway was one of those countries that supported it. And Norway was one of the countries that objected vigorously to it being removed. But it was removed in a closed door meeting uh, by the, the then chair of the Working Group on Crimes Against the Environment. And the, the Working Group was in fact closed down uh, fairly soon after that. Now, this is a law that simply needs to be put back in place where it should have been first time round. Just imagine where we would be today had that been put in place back then. The green economy would be a norm. Stat oil would probably be stat renewables, or I don't know, maybe they changed the name. But for whatever it would be, they'd be a highly successful company, uh, working for the state, I'm sure but also supplying energy from renewable industries rather than destructive industries. Or they would have maybe found the solutions to extracting oil that doesn't cause mass damage, destruction to a lot of ecosystems. Who knows, but they would have had that opportunity to find that out by now. And that's the amazing thing here, is that actually, it just goes to show you can't keep a good idea down, it'll just pop back out somewhere else. Now, we've done research on this. In fact, University of London, um, undertook fantastic research in the United Nations down in the basement library in Geneva. And we expected to pull out a few documents on this. In fact, we have two Libra Arch files of a paper trail of evidence on the law of ecocide. And what we discovered was that, in fact, a draft convention on the law of ecocide was drafted up in 1973 after the Stockholm conference, which had been opened calling for a law of ecocide. 7,000 people had gone out in the streets marching for a law of ecocide. And in fact, there were special working groups put into place at that conference to look at crimes against the environment. 
Well, the wonderful thing is, is that the United Nations has now put back in place, 16 years later, a new working group on crimes against the environment, which is one of the huge successes of bringing ecocide into the public domain last year. And now UNEP, the UN Environmental Programme, has set up at the very end of, of uh, 2012 its own special high-level advisory council on law, justice and governance, in particular to look at crimes against the environment and, and law of ecocide is part of that remit. And that is in part as a result of the huge international legal uh, and political engagement around this over just the last year alone, which is truly remarkable and that is a great success that actually came out of Rio uh, last year, uh, just before the Earth Summit, there was a huge World Congress held on law, justice and governance. So things are moving very fast here, which is truly wonderful. And this really takes me to my last slide. My second book, Earth is Our Business. We hold the earth in our hands. It's up to us what happens next. And this is about bold, moral and courageous leadership. Not just in business and politics, but within each and every single one of us to stand up and dare to be great and speak out. You know, that gets us out of our comfort zone sometimes to do that. But actually, it's what's required here. And it has happened before. And it will happen again. And civilization will put this law in place when the time is right. And I believe that time is now. And I want to leave you with just one story of a man who actually did stand up and speak out from a place of really bold, moral, courageous, uh, leadership in a very big way. And he was one of the biggest businessmen of his time 200 years ago during the height of slavery. His name was Charles Grant. And Charles Grant was a director of the British East India Company, one of the biggest companies in the world at that time. And the British East India Company stood to lose an awful lot of money with the abolition of slavery. And he was a man who stood up and he spoke out and he said, I support laws to be brought in to abolish slavery. Yet he stood to lose his livelihood, his status, an awful lot of money. But he did that because he recognized that the moral imperative trumped the economic imperative. And that's what's really at play here. It's about recognizing that it's about putting people on the planet first. But actually when we do that, we create resilient economies. In fact, this is one of the largest job creation schemes in the whole of the history of our universe. Because this is really about scaling up industry in a very big way to create the innovation in the other direction. And that was the beauty about the abolition of slavery. Not one of those 300 companies went out of business because it was given a transition period. And that's precisely what I have proposed as well that we have a five-year transition period from 2015 to 2020, where there's an amnesty, we don't take prosecutions, and in fact, governments do everything within the wherewithal to give assistance to those big companies. It is not in our interest to allow big companies to collapse. But this needs the voice of business to start to speak out. We need one or two Charles Grants or Charlie's Grants of this world to stand up and support this law. And I believe that this is possible. And in fact, what we're doing is we're creating the enabling conditions for this to happen. So next week, we're launching in the European Parliament a European Citizens Initiative. And a European Citizens Initiative is a new process whereby citizens can propose into Europe a new law, new directive that could be put in place. And that directive is an ecocide directive at a Europe-wide level, but it also has huge consequences for any company that has activities outside of Europe, any company that has a directors that are EU nationals, uh, any company that actually has investment flow from Europe as well. And all it requires is a million signatories from citizens right across the EU. Now, this allows political engagement and media engagement as this grows, it, it's, it's a very powerful opportunity to demonstrate leadership from the European Union. And what I saw today when I was in the peace 
the Nobel Peace Museum. There's a wonderful exhibition there uh, about Europe and why the, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to Europe at the end of last year. Because its aspirations were first and foremost peace. But the one country that gives the prize for it is you. And I'd love Norway to get to the place that it gives itself it, its own prize for really advancing a law because I Well, that we find our Charles Grant's here. We find the politician who will stand up and speak out, the businessman and the businesswoman. And that actually we find many, many people, the citizens, who stand up and speak out and call for this. This is also about engaging green politics. The Green Party in Europe hugely supports this. In fact, in Britain, the Green Party unanimously supported and, and passed a resolution in support of an international law beside Scotland. Uh, the very next week did exactly the same thing. So this is really about engaging citizens with politics, with bitterness, with law, all at the same time. And that's hugely important because actually we need to hear it from the people as well and empower citizens to stand up and speak out and say we want our leaders to demonstrate bold, courageous, moral leadership. Ultimately, this is a legacy issue. This is our chance to ask ourselves, what is it I will do to help co-create a beautiful world? Thank you.